And so we have come to my 10 favorite games of all time. Well, I mean, they might not necessarily be my 10 favorite games. I mean, maybe some of them you could substitute for the ones that I had in the first 10. I'm not good at arranging things in lists. If you've ever seen my best to worst lists, you know that this is true. But I'm pretty sure that these are my top 10 priorities when it comes to video games. And I wanted to talk about them a little bit. This one might surprise some people because it came out pretty recently. But I have to say that I just really have a soft spot in my heart for it. And it's Psychonauts 2. I was really debating whether I should actually talk about Psychonauts, the original one at this point, or 2. Because I also have a very special place in my heart for the original Psychonauts. It was a great game, Double Fine's masterpiece, as it stood for a very long time. Innovative, wonderful platformer, great storyline, great sense of humor, great art style. And I thought that I would put that here, but then, ultimately, I played Psychonauts 2. And what I experienced in Psychonauts 2 was a distillation of the ideas from that first game, but also an expansion of that. Not only did it look great and have wonderful environments and have wonderfully innovative worlds that either reach the same heights of the original or, in some cases, exceed them, um, but also just created much larger and more expansive and much more lived-in hub worlds and areas, and then you get to the story. And the story is miles away better, surprisingly enough, than the first game. Real questions about even the morality of what the Psychonauts do, but then the real trauma that comes from like generations going forward, and the experiences that Raz has with his family and, and the disconnect that he has, it's just so wonderfully done and so beautiful to explore. All of the different art styles that they put in feel so disparate from one another. They feel so unique and genuine as you go from one area to the next, one person's psyche to the next, and expand your repertoire of all of these different powers that you have available to you. Just leaps and bounds. Uh, ahead, in and one of the best platformers you will ever find. I could not make this list if I did not mention something from Legend of Zelda. For me, however, the best Legend of Zelda game that I enjoyed was Wind Waker. It's such a unique experience, first because they create this cel-shaded art style, and they take Link back to being, like, a little kid, and uh, having him traverse the seas. Like, there's so much water in this game. But his big, expressive eyes, and the kind of fun, quirky atmosphere that they start out with, then gets heavier and deeper and more meaningful as the game progresses. It just feels so engaging when you start, and ultimately ends up being so rich and deep and beautiful by the end. The characters that you meet, and the, the places that you go, and the temples and the bosses, it just sings. It just sings from beginning to end. An absolute joy. I don't really know what else to say about it, except that it nails the exploration elements, the, the classic Zelda elements of, you know, getting new tools so that you can unlock new areas. But there was a certain openness to the world of Wind Waker that you don't necessarily see in other like Zelda games, but they really emphasized it here, being able to just sail the open seas with the wind at your back and uh, and, and a sword in your hand. Uh, and, uh, you know, tingle aside, I personally prefer Wind Waker to, to basically every other Zelda game. Now, I will say that 
with the caveat that I, I actually have not played Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom. And those look super cool. But still, I mean, Wind Waker, folks. It, it's Wind Waker. <laughs> what do you want? Rockstar has done some very impressive sandbox games in their time, most notably the Grand Theft Auto series. But for me, it really is all about Red Dead Redemption. And it is at this point that I'm going to specify that I am not talking about Red Dead Redemption 2. I am talking about the original. John Marston's story in the Old West, tracking down his old gang, so that a bunch of company men essentially can let him see his family again is just quintessential Western action. But then they do this smart thing of creating this big, expansive, open, wild West setting that takes you from, you know, the, the Southwest all the way down into Mexico, from these rural ranches on the frontier to these cities eventually this wonderful landscape that's just teeming with life and also death <laughs> one of the weird things i experienced when i played like red dead redemption 2 was that these wonderful fight scenes that i had in the first game felt like they had changed the control scheme around to a place where i didn't like it as much but in that first game it, you know getting your six shooter out and going into dead eye mode and marking a target in six different places and then just like fanning a hammer is just so ultimately satisfying feels so good and in the middle of combat where you're you know racing for your life to make sure that you don't get shot but the real joy of red dead redemption was getting on your horse going off into the desert staring up at this big blue sky Seeing, you know, circling vultures off in the distance, seeing uh, a distant train track uh, with a train riding by, uh, seeing a few riders off in the sunset, and realizing that John Marston is standing on the precipice of great change in this place, that the, the encroachment of civilization is coming in, and realizing that you're in this very unique place in time and space. It does such a great job at emphasizing that and making you really want to explore it further. I just can't help myself. I have to put Nier Automata onto this list. I played the original Nier, and it was a very interesting game, and I like the idea of multiple endings, and especially the idea that you can get the true ending if you also allow the game to erase your save data. That's fascinating. And when I picked up Automata, I thought that they would do something like that. And they do, but what I did not expect is for the game world to be as inviting as it is, as engaging to look at as it is. This falling civilization, this seemingly once great world that is now just in collapse all around you, but also that they would do so much with the story, and that they would do so much with philosophy and the question of personhood. You are playing androids that are fighting robots, and everyone seems to be doing this for people, but no one knows like where the people are. And so this game asks a lot of questions about these artificial creations that seemingly have achieved a level of personhood and deep philosophical questions that then come into being about what does their life mean and where do they go from here it's just way more than you expect when you start the game when you start like the the flight sequences and then the beat em up parts and you see the perspective occasionally change from, like, behind the character to, like, a side-scroller thing. 
when you start that, you're like, wow, this is great, and it's stylistic, and it looks really cool, and the characters are really neat, and the design is really great, and the music is so beautiful and rich and everything. What you don't expect is that by the end of the game, you are going to be asking yourself some pretty deep questions about the nature of humanity itself. You do not expect that, but it is what you get. <laughs> and, and it deserves all the praise in the world for it. It really does. Not a lot of games achieve that level of complexity and introspection, but Nier Automata absolutely does. A lot of people right now are talking about Diablo 4, and my time playing some of the early beta releases of Diablo 4 suggests that, yeah, they're probably right. It, it seems pretty good. But... One of the reasons I think it's so good is because of the next game on my list, which is Diablo 2, a game that it borrows from heavily in tone and structure. Diablo 2 was the game that I played for I don't even know how many hours, uh, and through multiple characters. Played it online, I played it single player, I really enjoyed the single player. The storyline introduces a lot of really interesting characters, but your ability to play these really interesting, unique, different playable characters that all, you know, function very differently from one another, but also just what they did to essentially the hack and slash loot collection game is immeasurable. It did a way better job of this than the original Diablo ever did. But it also expanded the world and the storyline and the lore of that world and got into a really great game loop where you would battle monsters and you'd be achieving experience, but you'd also see loot drops and the loot flies out of them and you see something that looks brown or yellow and you're like, ooh, rares are uniques and I need to go and I need to to identify them and find out what cool loot I've just gotten. And before you know it, you gotta do another boss run and another boss run to try and do it better and better and better uh, and see if you can collect the best loot and make sure you max out your character level. And before you know it, you've spent 100 hours into it and you haven't even felt it. And what are you gonna do next? Like, Diablo 3 didn't even give me that feeling of, of wonder and addiction. But Diablo 2 definitely did, and I think it is a high point for the series, and it's certainly the one I remember most fondly. Now, I've been a little loose with my numbering up to this point, because I don't necessarily know if I could rank everything exactly this way. You could move them around. However, I will say that these top five are definitely the top five. <laughs> Number five, Stardew Valley. You knew I was going to put it on here somewhere, right? I had to. It was necessary. We've had a resurgence of cozy games in the last few years, and I like to think that that resurgence really started with Eric Barone's now seminal classic, Stardew Valley. The whole idea is so simple. You have gotten very tired of your corporate life, and you get word that your grandfather has died and has left you his farm. The thing about it is, is that the farm is in a state of disrepair. You go off to Pelican Town. You find your farm. It's got rocks and trees and brush all over the place, and you are now tasked with trying to figure out what you want to do with this farm. So everything from being able to craft and forage to being able to explore the different areas of this place to diving through the dungeons and beating up on monsters just encourages you to explore this world that has been built and utilize it in every way possible to build something. And then before you know it, you have a horse and you have a bunch of cows and pigs and everything and you're growing a fruit orchard and you're collecting a bunch of maple syrup over here and, oh, I have bee houses. That's pretty great. And you realize after all of that that you are now making 
endless amounts of fruit wine and collecting tons and tons of money. You're the toast of the town. Everybody loves you. You're collecting a bunch of artifacts for the library uh, and just doing all of these wonderful things to build the town up and become more vibrant and feeling like you have a place in this world. And it in turn makes you as the player feel like this is a place in the world for you. Pelican Town is not just, you know, a game world at that point. It really feels like a place that you belong in. It feels homey in that regard. Uh, and the people there have their own problems, and the people there have their own struggles that they go through, and so do you in this world, but you build something out of it. It's just great. Looking forward to Haunted Chocolatier. <laughs> Number four, Banjo-Kazooie. It's the best platformer ever. From the very beginning, the character design of Banjo and Kazooie is just terrific. Banjo is this honey bear, and he keeps Kazooie, who's a red-crested Briegel, in his backpack. It just immediately it seems absurd, especially because there's like a mole who's one of your best friends, there's a witch that has stolen uh, Banjo's sister, Tootie, and, uh, you know, the, the whole thing seems kind of silly. But then you get into the game, and it's colorful, and it's beautiful, and these individual worlds that you go into just have this tightness but richness. Like, they all have their own unique personality, but they're also chock full of things to do in a very small area. They do a lot with the size of each one of these worlds. As each one of them has their own theme music, you go underwater and it starts to muddle as if you're listening to the theme music up above you from underneath the water. There's these wonderful touches to it where you start to get new abilities and that unlocks new areas that you can go to as you explore Grunty's mountain in order to figure out, you know, how you can get your sister back. It just sings. It, it's so hard for a lot of platformers to get down the basic thing of making sure that the platforming of jumping around and performing these acrobatics feels alive and worthwhile. Banjo-Kazooie was one of those examples where it always felt satisfying to do. The controls felt really responsive and rich. The characters felt fun and alive. The worlds felt fun and alive. They always felt vibrant and uniquely distinct from one another. Right up until the end of the game. It's hard to tell you that there's another game that did it quite as well as Banjo-Kazooie, including subsequent entries in its own series. Number three, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. You know, the year that I heard they were going to come out with Knights of the Old Republic, they were also coming out with uh, Star Wars Boba Fett, which was like an action game. And... I remember me and my friends thinking, oh, well, the Boba Fett one looks interesting. I don't know what this Knights of the Old Republic is. That doesn't look very good. Uh, I have still not played the Boba Fett game, but uh, I have played KOTOR like three times. So, yeah, I was not smart back then. Uh, Knights of the Old Republic is just a great example of a role-playing game. Uh, the combat is real-time, but also allows you to pause the action. Uh, BioWare did this really smart thing where they realized it was going to be based off of, like, Dungeons & Dragons in terms of the system that was built, uh, the, the number crunching behind the scenes, so you can still play it like a turn-based RPG, like a Dungeons & Dragons, but also, just to keep the action moving, you can also kind of, like, play it in real time where everybody has a certain move time that they go to based on their speed. From the very beginning of the game where you have to escape the Endar Spire and you don't even know why anyone is chasing you because you don't remember anything about your past, all the way through the very good twists that they have in the storyline that explain why you don't remember any of it, uh, and finally through its conclusion where you take the new information about what happened to you and you utilize it in one of a few unique ways, is really great. And also to just highlight the idea of Star Wars, 
being able to pull yourself through the light side or the dark side of the force and not just have that be something that, you know, makes you look evil or look righteous or whatever, but also affects your relationships with other characters and also what happens to the world at large is great. Like, the choices that you make on Kashyyyk can lead to a full-scale open rebellion by the Wookiees or, uh, you know, a, a reinforcement of laws under Zerka Corporation. And you can make that happen. And then you see the results of your actions in real time. It's great. You feel like you're actually doing something meaningful. And that's not even getting into the series of events that lead through you learning force powers and how to hold a lightsaber and all of that. And that's not even talking about the wonderful NPCs that follow you, all of your companion characters who have their unique storylines that you can dig into and all feel like they're indicative of the world that you're in, like they all have unique stories that revolve around the Force and the Jedi and the Sith and the what happened with the Mandalorian Wars and, and all of this stuff that happened in this world that gets fleshed out by the characters that are in it. Dragon Age or Mass Effect, so much of that framing was seen with Knights of the Old Republic beforehand. And there's a reason why they kept going with that sort of framework for RPGs past it. And oh yeah, like the best plot twist in video gaming ever. So good. I I could not believe that I didn't see it coming when it came. Number two, Deus Ex. Ah, yes, yeah, some of you might have thought Deus Ex would be my number one game, but it's actually number two. Stay tuned to find out what's number one. But uh, yeah, Deus Ex is still one of the best games that I have ever played. Uh, I used to have this thing where when I got a new computer, I would boot up Deus Ex first to see how it ran on the new system. And it was just an excuse to play the game again, but hopefully with, you know, shorter load times and better graphic fidelity. And I, I have to tell you that it's just one of those games that made me love immersive sims. It was one of our, my first encounters with that genre. And in case people don't know what an immersive sim is, it's basically games where you have many different options in how you can approach a situation and uh, determine exactly how you want to address it. Uh, Deus Ex from that very first mission at the Statue of Liberty gives you so many different ways to to go about finding this terrorist leader and bringing him in or eliminating him altogether you you can start blowing up cameras or you can hack the cameras or you don't even have to go through the front door and you you could go around you could uh you know, stack up boxes on the back end of the building so you can get up to the higher levels there's so many options at your disposal from the very beginning and then on top of this really interesting structure for games that gives you so much replayability, you have unique character advancement where you get points by doing things in the game, and that allows you to uh, put them into certain skills, and those skills will make you better at certain things. So maybe I need less lockpicks in order to lock unlock this door. Maybe I can hack this control panel easier. And you get these canisters that also allow you to get these superhuman abilities that, you know, use up energy, but can make you super strong for a little while, or run really fast, or have a targeting reticle on people. It's just really cool. And then, after all of that, the through line as you're going level by level through this, uh, you know, futuristic dystopian world is that there's this massive conspiracy that's going on. And it introduces, like, every convoluted plot twist imaginable. The Knights Templar and the Illuminati and, like, aliens and genetic warfare is going on behind it. Like, e everything's involved with the storyline of Deus Ex, and you explore it right up until the end. And it's got such beautiful lore it, to the point where... 
I've played it so many times and I can't even really tell you exactly what's going on. It's just, it's it's bonkers, but it works so well in a very long, rich thrill ride that always keeps you on edge. Always has something new and terrifying around the corner and gives you a lot of replayability. Deus Ex is ultimately the game that made me fall in love with immersive sims. And immersive sims are one of my favorite genres of video games. Period. And at number one, Fallout New Vegas. I just kept contemplating where I was going to put New Vegas on this list. Uh, and I, I thought maybe I would put it lower, but then every time I came around to it, I would think, no, I like New Vegas more than this one, and this one, and this one, until I realized, oh, you know what? It's probably just number one. Like, literally the beginning of this game is you getting shot in the middle of the desert and left for dead. Don't worry, you get better. And then once you actually get introduced, very briefly, honestly, to the uh, framework of building your character at Doc Mitchell's place, you step out into Good Springs, and this world just unfolds in front of you. And it reminds you of, like, those old westerns, but at the same time, a dystopic, apocalyptic setting. It feels, at one instance, warm and inviting, but at the same time, very cold and dystopic and dangerous. And it is actually kind of both those things simultaneously. What Obsidian then does is introduce you to a plethora of interesting scenarios, choices, and characters that beg to be explored as fully as you possibly can. Not only is the gameplay really good, not only is it very open-ended and rewards you for exploration, or sometimes punishes you terribly for stumbling into something you definitely shouldn't have gone towards, but there's always something memorable that's around every corner. And it's not just the main game that sings, although the main campaign where you are a courier trying to figure out why anyone wanted to steal the package, this mysterious package that you were supposed to deliver, and then trying to recover it so that you can get it to Mr. House, who it was supposed to be delivered to, is a really cool storyline, especially after that, when you have to resolve a conflict through all of these major factions. But then you get into the beauty of the other storylines, the sub-stories that are going on beyond the scenes. And once you get into all of that, and what's happening with all of the individual parts of this game, and how they all interlock into each other, that's where the beauty really comes in. And it just engages you and pulls you into its world, and it never lets go. I've played, like, all the Fallout games. None of them achieved that to the level that New Vegas does. Every vault that you go into, every, like, sub-quest and mission that you take on seems incredibly story-rich and introduces these new characters. And obviously there, there are some that are not nearly as good, more shallow than others, but the hit ratio is so high. <laughs> it just really is. And I haven't even started talking about the DLC, because once I start talking about those four beautiful pieces of content, we'll be here all day. Fallout New Vegas begs you to keep playing it in different ways. But one of the reasons why you're more likely to do it in this game rather than other epic RPGs is because you know that the storyline and the setting are so rich and vibrant and have so much to offer you. There are traps around every corner. They are placed very strategically. There are ambushes around every corner. You will stumble into a nest of Deathclaws, 
You can do that pretty quickly without even trying. You need to know the terrain and you need to understand the world that you're in. And uh, New Vegas invites you to do that while making it very clear that it is not going to be a field trip. And by the time you get to the end and you see the resolution of all the things that you've done culminate to that battle at Hoover Dam, you will sit back and remember that you played one of the greatest video games of all time. And in a lot of ways, I would say that all the games that are on this list that I mentioned did give me that sense above all others. That when I completed them, when I sat back and thought about what I had just experienced, there was a sense of wonder a real resonance to having played them. Not every game can do that, but these did. They had so much resonance that I kept them with me up to the point that I made this list. And I wonder if others felt that same way, if other people took away the same thing I took away from those same games. Or if they took something else away from a different game. What made them feel that way? Did I miss anything? Yes. I'm sure, I'm sure I missed some games that I, I forgot about. Oh, I didn't even talk about Witcher 3. Well, the, that, that's, a, that's a whole conversation in and of itself. Uh, or Prey. I didn't talk about Prey. Oh, I didn't talk about Dishonored. Oh, no! Oh no! Now I'm gonna have to do a a, a a additional ten. Darn it! Thank you for joining me here on the Titanium Mine. I hope you have a fine enough trip back up to the surface. In the meantime, I'm gonna go see if I can put some more things on this list. See if there's anything good that just came out that I might be able to put onto the best games of the list. Let's see. Well, I did try Redfall. That didn't work out so well. Um, oh, Gollum. Yeah, maybe that... Maybe that's gonna... Ooh, Forspoken! Hello? Yeah, I, I would be scared, too. That was an appropriate response. <laughs> <laughs>